Our two youngest children were born when we lived in Jacksonville, Illinois. One day, I backed our car out of the garage, about three feet, when I got this strong urge to stop and look over my shoulder one more time. And there, barely visible, was just a little bit of the top of our two-year-old son James' head. Right behind the car. He had a little tyke's horse. He would straddle it and propel himself with his legs. But when he sat on it, it put him very low to the ground. He was on that horse right behind the car. And initially, I did not see him. Carolyn saw the whole thing happen from the kitchen window. As I was checking to make sure that James was okay, she rushed outside and she told me that the back bumper of our car was up against our son's shoulder as he sat on that little tyke's horse. If I had backed out any further, I would have run over our son. Two verses of scripture came to my mind that day. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 91 which is where those two verses are found. Psalm 91. If possible, please stand again for the reading of Scripture out of respect for the inspired Word of God. We've been singing praise to God this morning. The Psalms contain some of the oldest songs of praise to God, some of them written as much as 3,000 years ago, but they are just as relevant, just as meaningful as if they had just been written. They apply to our lives. Today, I want to continue a message I began last week, a message entitled, Staying Closer to the Lord. Please follow along. I want to read Psalm 91, verses 9 through 16. Psalm 91, 9, the Word of God states, Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thank you. Please be seated. I hope you have a copy of our sermon notes. Here's the first thing I want to emphasize from this portion of the inspired word of God. First, stay close to the Lord and you will experience security and his protection. Stay close to the Lord and you will experience security and his protection. If that sounds familiar, it should. That was the first point in last week's message. And the entire psalm emphasizes that wonderful truth. For just a moment, let's review. Look back at verses 1 and 2, which has a personal testimony. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I will trust. Then notice in verses 9 and 10 the similarity, except it's addressing other people who do the same thing. Verse 9, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Over 20 times in the book of Psalms, it referred to the Lord as our refuge a place of security, safety, protection. When you face opposition or some threat or danger, the Lord himself will be your safety, your shelter, your security. Verse 9 also says, He is the Most High. That emphasizes his power as the sovereign ruler of the entire universe. He is greater than all other so-called gods false gods. He's high above every other power. There is no enemy, no threat, no danger that can ever overpower him. And he's the one whom we should worship and serve. So do what verse 9 says. Make the Lord your refuge, 
your dwelling place. Stay close to him at all times. Not just drawing close to the Lord only in times of danger or need or trouble, but continually make the Lord your refuge, your dwelling place. Many of us remember walking with our children when they were young and remember how difficult it was to get them to stay close to us. Remember that? They were so full of energy, always wanting to run around. But we knew that the further away they got, the less they could experience our protection and help if they needed it. And the truth is that any of us can stray away from the Lord in our daily lives. And the farther we get away from Him spiritually, the more we miss out on His protection and His help. So stay close to Him. Look at the last part of verse 10, where it says, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That word plague brings to mind the 10 devastating plagues that God sent on Egypt and how the Israelites, who also lived there at the time, were not affected at all. As I mentioned last week, this psalm may be referring to safety and protection experienced by God's people in times when God sends judgment upon the ungodly. No harm, no trouble will be experienced by a faithful, faithful believer unless it is part of God's loving plan. And God can and will overrule what people intend as evil against you, and God can and will bring evil out of it and bring glory to himself in the process. Recently, I read a story from an old copy of the Our Daily Bread devotional magazine. I shared this story some weeks ago, but it fits so perfectly with Psalm 91 that I want to repeat it today. It involves a woman named Lori Anderson. She was a missionary in Peru to the Kandoshi Shepra Indians who were head shrinkers. One day she was looking for a quiet place for her daily time of Bible reading and prayer. She went down by the edge of a river. After reading the Bible, she took up her prayer list. With her eyes closed, she did not see the deadly anaconda weaving through the water. Didn't even know it was there until it struck. It dug its fangs deep into her arm. It struck her arm again and again as it held her screaming in its coils. But then that giant snake, never known to release its prey, suddenly released its grip on Lori and slithered off through the water. While Lori was being treated by a medical doctor, a witch doctor from a nearby village burst into the hut where they were and stared at her. The witch doctor couldn't believe that Lori had survived. That witch doctor said that her son-in-law, who was also a witch doctor, had chanted that day to the spirit of the anaconda and asked it to kill the young missionary. Lori says, I'm certain that except for the protection of God, it would have worked. But Lori did what verse 9 talks about. She made the Lord her refuge. She made the Most High God her dwelling place. Right before that snake's attack, she had been spending time with the Lord, drawing close to Him through Bible reading and prayer. The truth is that none of us know when we might encounter real danger or trouble, but you can be prepared in advance by staying close to the Lord continually. Let's read on the screen a verse that we read last week. It's a verse that applies to each of us. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. One reason that God's people experience safety and security in times of danger or trouble is found in verses 11 and 12. Look at those verses. The Word of God states, For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And those are the two verses that came to my mind when I almost ran over our two-year-old son with a car. So here's the second thing I want to personally emphasize from this portion of the Word of God. Second, give praise and thanks to God for sending angels to help and rescue and protect you. Give praise and thanks to God for sending angels to help and rescue and protect you. 
it says, he will give his angels charge over you. That word charge means an order. Just like a general would order his troops, God gives orders to his troops, his holy angels. He orders them to keep us, to guard us. Now, God can and he often does accomplish many things all by himself. I'm not suggesting for one split second that God is dependent upon any of his servants. He is and always will be all-powerful. But at times, God chooses to order angels to carry out his work on earth and accomplish his purpose. The Bible does not tell us exactly how many angels there are, but it's obvious that there are a huge number. Look at the screen. Let's read together from Revelation chapter 5. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. 10,000 times 10,000 angels and thousands of thousands. That doesn't mean do the multiplication and you can figure out exactly how many angels there are. The Bible says there is an innumerable company of angels, a huge number. And God's angels obediently carry out his will. They never deviate from God's orders. They never attempt to change God's plans. They obey him. Let's read together Psalm 103 and verse 20. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Angels never call attention to themselves. Never. They obey the Lord. They serve him. They glorify him, but never themselves. And angels are powerful, much more so than human beings. There in the notes, I've listed some references if you want to do some more study on how powerful angels are. For example, the book of Isaiah chapter 37 records how just one angel killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night. Just one angel. The Bible tells us that one angel rolled away that heavy stone from the entrance to Jesus' tomb. And Revelation tells us that one angel has the power to seize the devil and throw him into the bottomless pit at some point in the future. Angels are powerful. God sends his angels to encourage people who need it. I've listed some more references in the note. For example, the book of Judges records how an angel appeared to the discouraged judge Gideon and encouraged him to go to battle against a huge army, 135,000 soldiers, the army of the Midianites, 135,000 enemy soldiers. You know how many soldiers Gideon had? God had trimmed his army down to 300. But who else was with the Lord, was with Gideon? The Lord was. And so the angel came to encourage Gideon. First Kings chapter 19 records how when Elijah, fearing for his life, ran from the wicked queen Jezebel who wanted to kill him, God sent an angel who prepared a meal for Elijah. An angel encouraged the prophet Daniel. An angel encouraged Jesus as he prayed there in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the book of Acts records how during a violent storm at sea, an angel assured Paul that none of his traveling companions would be lost. They'd all be rescued, and they were. God also orders his angels to protect and rescue people from potential harm, which never happens, or actual danger, which does. I've listed more references there in the notes. For example, before God destroyed Sodom, he sent two angels to warn Lot and his family to flee. And those angels took Lot and his family by the hand and pulled them out of Sodom just before it was destroyed. The Bible also tells us that when Elisha's servant was afraid because a huge Syrian army had encircled their city, The prophet declared to his servant, don't be afraid. There are more with us than there are with them. Now, the servant may have thought, what do you mean more with us? I can count you and me, Elisha, one, two. What do you mean there's more with us than there are with them? Well, then Elisha prayed, Lord, 
open his eyes that he may see. And God did, and the servant saw that the nearby mountain was full of chariots and horses. God's mighty angels. After Daniel spent the night in the den of lions, he reported to the king, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so they haven't hurt me. The New Testament tells us how the Sadducees arrested Jesus' apostles and threw them in prison for proclaiming the gospel. But at night, an angel opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. Ironically, the Sadducees who arrested the apostles, did not believe in angels. So God's used an angel they didn't believe in to set the apostles free. Later on, when Peter was imprisoned again, an angel brought him out, and the iron gate of the prison opened all by itself. Look at verses 11 and 12 of Psalm 91 again. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, to guard you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Somebody in the New Testament quoted verses 11 and 12. But it was Satan. He took Jesus up on the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. And Satan said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Satan quoted Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. But that's a tragic example of how wonderful promises in God's word can be foolishly applied. Satan, when he quoted those verses to Jesus, Satan twisted the meaning of those wonderful verses. He used these verses in Psalms about trusting God, And he tried to get Jesus to test God. God the Father had already been keeping Jesus safe and would continue to do so. There was no need for Jesus to test God the Father by hurling himself off the highest point of the temple and expecting his Father to send angels to prevent him from getting hurt. Let's read together from Matthew chapter 4 how Jesus responded to Satan's challenge. It is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. The word tempt in that verse actually means test. You should not put God to the test. Jesus quoted a specific verse of scripture to resist each of Satan's specific temptations. And you need to saturate your mind with the truth of God's word that specifically applies to your weaknesses. You know what your weaknesses are. Do you think Satan knows? We've given him plenty of opportunity to observe. You need to prepare your heart and mind in advance by storing up God's word in your heart, in your mind, and using specific verses from God's word to resist specific weaknesses. The more of God's word that you will hide in your heart, committing it to memory, the more you'll have on hand to help you in times of need when you face specific temptations. And don't put yourself in unnecessary danger and presume that God will send an angel to protect or rescue you, as Satan tried to get Jesus to do. By the way, after Jesus resisted everyone's, every one of Satan's temptations, let's read together Matthew 4.11. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Most of the time, angels remain invisible, except on special occasions when it's God's will for them to be seen. If you are saved, when you get to heaven, you may have an angel come up and tap you on your glorified shoulder and say, remember that time on earth when you were in real trouble? I was there. You didn't see me, but I carried out God's orders and I protected you. And just because angels don't seem to appear on a regular basis today does not mean that they're not here. It does not mean that they are no longer helping us. Let's read together how Hebrews 1.14 describes God's angels. Ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. 
but the people to whom angels have appeared often do not recognize them as angels because they look just like men. Let's read together Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 2. Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. Some of us, maybe all of us, have encountered angels without realizing that they really were angels. Times when you were protected and rescued because God ordered one or more of his holy angels, his mighty angels, to help you. My mother was an accomplished church pianist. When she was a single young lady in college, about 10 years before I was born, she was invited to fill in on the piano at a country church on a Sunday night. After the service, she got in her car, she drove out of the parking lot, she turned onto a gravel road that led to a two-lane highway that she would take to go back to college. At the end of that gravel road, she came to a stop sign, and she realized she had not yet committed her return trip to the Lord. So there in the car, she paused, she prayed briefly, asked God for safety, then started to turn right onto that two-lane highway. But rather her car moving onto the highway, it rolled along on the shoulder of the road next to the highway. She tried to steer the car up onto the pavement, but she couldn't. It was like the steering wheel was locked. She was puzzled because she had turned out of the church parking lot onto that gravel road just a moment earlier. But now, try as she might, she could not steer the car onto the highway. And just then, a semi came roaring around the curve behind her and sped right past her. She hadn't seen it earlier. It was around the curve. And as soon as that semi passed, her steering wheel unlocked, and she was able to steer the car up onto the highway and continue on. And she realized if she had been on the highway just a moment earlier, she would have likely been hit, maybe even killed, by that semi. Later on, she heard someone teach about angels. She thought back on the event I've just described. She came to believe that God had sent an unseen angel to protect her that night. And she thought, of course I couldn't move the steering wheel, couldn't get it to turn. My strength is no match for one of God's angels. Now remember, I said that happened 10 years before I was born. So today, I'm definitely giving praise and thanks to God for sending angels to help and rescue and protect his people. Look at verse 13 of Psalm 91. The word of God continues, you shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Lions are predators. They stalk their prey. The king cobra is the world's largest poisonous snake. It and other snakes hide in waiting before attacking. Lions and snakes both have the power to kill. They represent all the deadly threats and attacks that you might face. And that statement there in the second half of the verse, you shall tread and you shall trample underfoot, that represents God's help and God's protection in time of danger. Or threats. But once again, don't take God's wonderful promises and apply them foolishly. The Bible does record how God protected Daniel from a den of lions, records how God protected Paul when he was bitten by a poisonous snake. But that doesn't mean that you can approach those and other wild animals carelessly. Here's the third thing I want to emphasize from this portion of the Word of God. Third, give praise and thanks to God for the blessings. He gives to those who know and love him. Give praise and thanks to God for the blessings he gives to those who know and love him. The first 13 verses of Psalm 91 are written from the psalmist's perspective. But that changes in verses 14, 15, and 16 as God himself speaks and God describes the blessings he gives to those who know and love him. Look at verse 14 of the text. And hear what God says in verse 14. 
God says, because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Now, the Bible doesn't identify anybody specifically to whom those pronouns he and his and him refer. I think that signifies that anybody who knows and loves God will experience his blessings. Those who set their love upon the Lord. That word translated love does not mean an emotional feeling. It refers to a deep longing for God, a clinging to him out of love for him and loyal to him. And so those who love God will be delivered by him. Another reference to his protection and help. God also says in verse 14, I will set him on high. That literally means I will raise him to a high, safe, secure place. It also could signify that God will exalt that person who knows and loves him. The end of verse 14 where it says, he has known my name. To know God's name does not mean that you merely know the word, capital G-O-D. It means to know him personally. To have a constant, intimate personal relationship with him. A name represents the entire person. When you hear somebody's name, what you know to be true about that person comes to your mind. You don't have to see them. You just have to hear their name. And God's name represents all that's true about him, all that he's revealed about himself in the Bible. The good news is, the good news is that you can have a personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus. Let's read together what Jesus said in John chapter 14. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. If you've never come to know God personally through faith in Jesus, please do so today. That's the only way to know God personally. Not just know facts about him, but you can know God personally if you'll put your personal faith in Jesus. Another blessing experienced by those who know and love God is answered prayer. Look at verse 15. As God continues speaking, it says in verse 15, He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. First part of verse 15 brings to mind what God said in Jeremiah 33 and verse 3. Let's read that wonderful verse together. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. God invites us to call to him. He commands it to call to him in prayer. And as we pray, we connect our needy situations to God's supply. And what we think might be a lack of things on our part is no match for God's abundance. He's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. Ephesians 3.20. Answered prayer is evidence that God really is aware of our personal situations. It's evidence that he loves us and takes care of us. A man named Josh McDowell served with Campus Crusade for Christ for years. He would lecture on secular campuses and defend the truth of the Bible and take questions from the students there. He's spoken to over 46 million people in 118 different countries. He's a prolific author. His book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, was ranked 13th in Christianity Today's list of the most evangelical Christian books published after World War II. It's a scholarly defense of the truth of the Bible. But earlier in life, when Josh was attending seminary in California, his father went home to be with the Lord. His mother had died some years earlier, and Josh was not sure whether or not she had been saved. He became depressed, wondering if she'd ever been saved. And so he prayed, Lord, somehow give me the answer so I can get back to normal. Two days later, Josh drove out to the ocean. He walked to the end of a pier wanting to be alone. But there at the end of that pier sat an elderly woman in a chair, fishing. She asked Josh, where's your home originally? He replied, Michigan. Union City. Nobody's ever heard of it, so I tell people it's a suburb of 
The woman interrupted, a suburb of Battle Creek. I had a cousin from there. Do you happen to know the McDowell family? Stunned, Josh McDowell replied, I'm Josh McDowell. The woman said, I'm a cousin to your mother. Josh asked, do you remember anything at all about her spiritual life? Why, sure, the lady replied. Your mother and I were teenagers when a tent revival came to town. It was the fourth night of the meeting, and we both went forward to accept Christ. And Josh exclaimed out loud, praise God, startling all the other surrounding fishermen. Thank God for his answers to prayer. In addition, in addition to answering our prayers, God also says in verse 15, in regard to those who love and know him, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. Would you meditate on those last few words? God promises to honor those who know him and love him. In this life, perhaps. Definitely in the life to come. Jesus said in John 12, 26, if anyone serves him, my father will honor him. So serve God faithfully and God will honor you. There are even more blessings that God gives to those who love him and know him. Look at verse 16. As God continues, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. In the Old Testament, long life was a promise from God given to those who would live in obedience to God's law. The Bible also promises long life to God's people in the future kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth. That Hebrew phrase translated long life at the beginning of verse 16 generally refers to a long and blessed life here on earth. But it can also mean forever. For example, Psalm 23, 6 states, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the exact same Hebrew word translated long life in verse 16 of our text. The emphasis on verse 16 may be on both long life here on earth and everlasting life in God's presence. And that word salvation, last word in the verse, can mean deliverance from enemies or danger or trouble. For example, when the Israelites reached the Red Sea and saw the Egyptian army pursuing them, let's read together what Moses said. Watch for the word salvation. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And God did save the Israelites. He delivered them from the Egyptians. Of course, that word salvation can also mean salvation from sins. It's good to have Ellen Trent here today. Ellen, God bless you. Her son, Jonathan, her daughter, Kim. I was thinking just the other day how Floyd Trent experienced everything mentioned in verse 16. A long life here on earth, 80 years, being satisfied by God's faithful provision, salvation through faith in Jesus, and now everlasting life in the Lord's glorious presence. He's been delivered from all pain, all sickness, all trouble, all sorrow. He is experiencing eternal life with the Lord in heaven. Trusting, obeying, and serving the Lord brings blessings in this life. The Lord delivers us. He protects us. He rescues us. He answers our prayers. He honors us. He blesses us. And he satisfies those who know and love him. Trusting, obeying, and serving the Lord also brings rewards in the life to come. Let's read together what the Apostle, what the Apostle Paul assured his protege, Timothy. Godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Blessings here and now and a retirement plan that's out of this world. Literally. Psalm 91 is a wonderful song of praise and thanks to God for the way that he takes care of us, the way he blesses us, those who belong to him. This last week, I read about John Wesley, along with his brother Charles, one of the founders of the Methodist Church. When John Wesley was about 21 years old, he began attending the prestigious Oxford University in England. He came from a Christian home, 
God had blessed him with a keen mind and good looks. Yet, in those days, he was a bit snobbish and sarcastic. One night, however, something happened that brought about a change in John Wesley's life. He was speaking with a porter, and he learned the man had only one coat, and he lived in such impoverished conditions that he didn't even have a bed. Yet Wesley observed that that man was an unusually happy person, filled with gratitude to God. Wesley, being immature at that stage in life, thoughtlessly joked about the man's misfortunes. And what do you have to thank God for? He asked with a touch of sarcasm. That porter smiled and replied joyfully, I thank him that he has given me life and being. He's given me a heart to love him. And above all, he's given me a constant desire to serve him. Wesley was deeply moved. He recognized that man knew something about the true meaning of gratitude. And that experience changed John Wesley's life. Many years later, he lay on his deathbed, the age of 88. And the people who gathered around him listened as despite his extreme weakness, he sang an old hymn, I'll praise my maker while I have breath. Brings to mind Psalm 150, verse 6, the last verse in the whole book of Psalms. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise my maker while I have breath. And so should we. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen? I'd like to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your many, many, many blessings, the way that you take care of us, you rescue us, you protect us. I want to thank you even for times when you've ordered angels to come and take care of us and we may have not seen them or maybe haven't recognized them as angels. Thank you for the way that you order your angels to take care of us. Thank you for the blessing of answered prayer. Thank you for all the many blessings that you send, every one of them completely undeserved, the result of your grace. Thank you most of all for the blessing of salvation made possible by the death of the Lord Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. I pray for anyone here today, anyone who's joining us through social media, who's never put their faith in Jesus alone and received salvation. I pray that today might be the day when they trust Jesus as their personal Savior. I pray that you would bless now in this time of invitation for your honor and your glory, because you are worthy. I pray this in the name of Jesus, our wonderful Savior. Amen.